Thank you very much, Dr. Baliga. Our second speaker this evening is also no stranger to Fordham, having lectured at the university on various occasions and having occupied the Loyola chair during the 2001-2002 academic year. John William O'Malley of the Society of Jesus is university professor at Georgetown University. A historian of the Renaissance and the early modern period, Father O'Malley's books include The First Jesuits, Trent and All That, and Four Cultures of the West. His most recent accomplishment in print is What Happened at Vatican II, which like his previously uh, mentioned volumes is published by Harvard University Press. All these accomplishments in print are perhaps only outdone by Father O'Malley's prowess in the kitchen. <laughs> where inspired by his Cambridge neighbor, Julia Child, John delighted many a community member and visitor with his mastery of Italian cuisine. <laughs> what happened at Vatican II is a remarkable accomplishment of historical theology in a distinguished scholarly career that has skillfully examined art, culture, preaching, religious life, and the priesthood, to name a few topics of Father O'Malley's sizable scholarly corpus. O'Malley manages to distill in 300 packed but never burdensome pages not only the chronicle of the council and the people who comprised it, but more resourcefully, the underlying epistemological, theological, organizational, and cultural tensions which continue to characterize its interpretation and implementation in our day. Father O'Malley. Thank you very much, Claudio. I'm delighted to be here. As uh, Claudio mentioned, I'm certainly not a stranger to Fordham and I'm not a stranger to New York City, which I love very much. Tonight, what we're doing is trying to sort of set uh, Vatican II in a large context of all the councils of the church and try to uh, sort of sort out how it's different and distinctive as well as how it's like the other councils. So. Chris has set the stage very well. I would say, just to begin with, a definition of what a council is. It's a meeting, principally, as looked at historically, a meeting principally of bishops gathered in Christ's name to make decisions binding on the church. And I think that definition fits all the so-called 21 ecumenical councils. Can you hear me? Yes. And uh, as well as the thousands, the thousands of local or provincial councils. So they're extremely important as the way the church manages itself. We don't want to forget that. At any rate, if we put Vatican II in the context of these councils, as uh, Chris has shown, the councils differ very much among themselves. But in terms of being special, Vatican II is incomparably special. It has a number of really unique features that set it off almost to the point, I would say, that it becomes a different kind of entity. So what are some of these special features of Vatican II? Well, just to, to start on a more superficial level, the first fact that strikes you is its immense size. I call it, I've been saying this for years now, no one's challenged me, I call it the biggest meeting in the history of the world. That's quite a statement, and no one challenged me. Now, by a meeting, I mean a gathering to do business, where decisions are reached, not just some kind of, not just a celebration. The, uh, 
uh, Chris mentioned, the council goes on for four years, but they're two years of intense preparation. The number of bishops who, at one point or another, took part in Vatican II, about 2,800. At any given time in the council, there were anywhere between about 2,200 and 2,300 bishops there, besides theologians. In Rome, during the council, people in the city having direct or indirect business with the council numbered probably, modestly, somewhere around seven or 8,000. So it was a tremendous uh, gathering of people. Moreover, it was a truly international, in a sense, than the other councils were. So uh, representatives from 116 different countries. Nothing like that ever been seen before in the history of the churches. Uh, Chris mentioned at Trent, really all the councils except uh, uh, just a few bishops and latter and five, there were no non-Europeans there. Uh, and at Vatican I, there were a fair number of missionary bishops, but most of them were not native born. And most of them were either European or uh, North American. So uh, this is a tremendous change from other councils. Uh, Trent itself, but it opened for 29 bishops. It's quite a difference. The council never got, had more than 200 bishops, and practically all of them were from Italy, Spain, or Portugal. At the very end of the council, about 15 French bishops appeared. So, one very big distinctive feature of Vatican II. The length of the preparation of the council, two years of intense preparation. The, uh, when John announced the council, shortly thereafter, Cardinal Giardini sent a letter to all the bishops of the world telling them to send in their suggestions for the council. So it's an open-ended agenda. And there's a wonderful response to that. And that those responses feel well, folio size, almost folio size volumes, about 800 pages. So that gives you some idea of the kind of preparation that went into this council. And then those, that information was then refined and put into preparatory documents. Another very special feature about Vatican II that we sort of take for granted is the impact of the media. Radio, television, and telephone, brand new for a council. This meant that there was communication back and forth between what was going on in the council and how it was being received and how people were reacting to the outside world. This also means that the, uh, it was a, 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 an item of great public interest. The New York Times, Le Mans, Die Welt, the major newspapers around the world carried, consistently carried stories about the council. And the council's issues were debated in the public, uh, in the public sphere. Uh, the council's issues were therefore debated around the kitchen table, uh, especially once they, during the council, when the first uh, change in the uh, procedure of mass was, was introduced. There's a lot of discussion right around, the, right around the table. This was possible because of the rapid uh, communication of the contemporary world, of the mid of the mid 20th century. Uh, sorry, Chris, but Latter One, Latter Two, Latter Three. Who knew about them? Or basically, who cared? <laughs> <laughs> They're basically the interests of high churchmen and leading political figures, and. That was the end of it. Even the Council of Constance that settled, that settled schism, yes, that was more widely known and discussed. But even that was reached a small, small, small segment of the population. There's just no way that, that could be communicated. The presence of the observers, uh, the Christian observers of the Council, about 100 of them more or less, the number varied. Never before in a Council had people been present and honored and reverenced that based their religious faith on principles different from the Catholic Church. Now, heretics were there, but they stood there in the dock in other councils. 
But now this is a, a new feature that also influenced the way the council was made, made special. Finally, the great scope of the council. Uh, with that letter of Cardinal Tardini, the gates were opened for a complete review of all aspects of church life. Now, during the council, Paul VI, in fact, removed four items from the agenda. One was priestly celibacy, one was birth control, and the second was birth control, the third was reform of the Roman Curia, and the fourth was an instrument to implement the doctrine of collegiality. So we can discuss like the viability or non viability of that action. But other than that, the um, floor was open. And if you read the council documents, you will see uh, it talks about the use of organ in church services, uh, when holy water can be blessed, uh, priest salaries, the boundary of dioceses, stop by nuclear weapons, the aims, aims of marriage, besides a number of other issues. So the list goes on and on and on. However, as Chris said, the focus of the interest and scope of the council you find in the 16 final documents. Just let me give you the list of them to refresh your memory. I have that list here someplace. Um, oh, yes. Liturgy, mass media, church, revelation, bishops, Two on priests, religious life, laity, missions, Eastern Catholic churches, education, ecumenism, religious liberty, non-Christian religions, the church of the modern world. So, big topics. Emerging from that mass of topics and concerns, were some issues that are sort of become hallmarks of the council. You're familiar with these. I list here simply four. The first one is the reform of the liturgy, and especially the introduction of the vernacular into the liturgy. This is part of the whole wrestling with this idea of the Eurocentrism of the church, and more basically, the principle of the active participation of every member of the congregation in the liturgical action. That's the first and most fundamental principle of the liturgical uh, re re uh, revision. And it also has implications for how the church itself behaves. Because as you pray, so you believe, so you act. Second one, the Declaration of Religious Liberty. Believe it or not, this was a hot issue of the council. It's a document that had a very difficult time getting through because still the Holy See was maintaining that the Catholic ideal was that of an established church with toleration or even civil disabilities for people who were not Catholics. So this was actually ratified in Concordats in the 1950s with Franco Spain and Salazar's uh, Portugal. So it's not simply an abstract idea, but a reality, and that was changed. A new relationship to Protestants, Orthodox, and Jews, from hostility, rivalry, to reconciliation, and a lot of practical in, in, import. For instance, you could now go to a Protestant funeral. You could now go to a Protestant wedding. Uh, you could, uh, uh, a nun in a Catholic hospital could now call a Protestant minister to assist the dying, and so forth. So it was a change, almost a 180 degree change. And then Episcopal collegiality, which uh, was mentioned. So this collegiality was an attempt to revive what early on had been the normal procedure in church governance, namely the decision-making power of the bishops gathered together, not simply in these general councils, as I said, in these thousands of local and provincial councils, and to 
balance, therefore, the leadership of the Roman pontiff with the collegial responsibility of the bishops for the rest of the church. And it was a, a teaching that, that sort of followed uh, into despotude. It was not, uh, not, no attention was being paid to it, and the council tried to bring that back. So I just say this. No council has ever attempted such a sweeping uh, revision of practices which entail also a revision of certain priorities and values. Uh, so that fact alone would set the council off from all of its predecessors. Trent, for instance, although it did uh, uh, have a wide agenda. Basically, in terms of doctrine, it was two, two ideas. One was the doctrine of the sacraments and the doctrine of, doc, uh, doctrine of justification. Those would be the two, only two doctrinal focuses of Trent. And then its reform was a reform of ecclesiastical offices, the papacy, the episcopacy, and the uh, pastorates. The agenda, but nothing like Vatican II. Well, there is one more feature of Vatican II that is utterly, absolutely special. And that is that it talks funny. Uh, if you look at the documents of Vatican II, you will see that they speak in a way and in a language that's altogether distinctive and that uh, is much it off from all the previous councils. As a matter of fact, Vatican II is extremely verbose. If you take the documents, the final documents of all these 21 councils that we're dealing with, Vatican, the documents of Vatican II account for about 25%. The Council of Trent would be about 18%, and then you've got all the rest. So that fact alone, uh, again, points out, points to its importance, but also to this shift in style. So when the Council met, there was this almost across the board rejection of the documents that had been prepared for the council. And a standard criticism of them was their language. That it was too juridical, too intellectualized, not pastoral. Uh, and in the course then of the next uh, 12 months, the documents were rewritten and written in a different style, supposedly a more pastoral style. What this actually entailed was a recovery of the style of speaking and preaching, basically, of the fathers of the church. So a more rhetorical style, a more pastoral style, and I can tell you in greater detail what that revision entailed. First of all, where did councils get their procedure? The first council, supposedly the Council of Jerusalem, we don't know much about, which is the uh, well, the, the, the apostles met there with, with Paul, they discussed the case of decision. But then once we get to the third century and begin to have a number of local councils, they obviously follow the procedures of local Roman political institutions, which were on at least a, a, a small level uh, judicial and legislative. But the first clear example we have of their following that program is the Council of Nicaea, convoked by the emperor, held in his palace. He opens the council, and he treats the council as sort of an ecclesiastical Roman senate. And that is how the council itself acted. It passed laws, and it uh, judged 
error in judge heretics. So they have a legislative and judicial function. Uh, that entailed then a certain literary style. First of all, a literary form. Now there are many literary forms, but the most characteristic literary form throughout the centuries of the councils was the canon. What is a canon? It's a short ordinance prescribing or proscribing certain actions, whether that's speaking or, or doing something. So, for instance, the uh, Council of Nicaea, I forget how many they issued, I think about 14 or so. The Council of Trent issued 123 canons on the doctrinal issues alone. A typical one is, if anyone would say the Mass is not a true sacrifice, let him be anathema, that is to say, excommunicated. So we've got a statement. It's about note. Some kind of observable behavior. It's not about an inner sentiment. It's not about being a heretic. It's saying heretical things. Or it's doing bad actions. So it's about behavior modification as a good law should be. Uh, this entails, so you've got a literary form, the canon. This brought with it a vocabulary of punishment, exclusion, who's in, who's out, and sometimes of downright enmity. Uh, the Council of Constance, for instance, among its many other things, it decreed the condemnation of Jan Hus and turned him over to the second arm to be burned at the stake. It's not exactly a gesture of friendship. Uh, so that's what I mean by this, uh, uh, that's an extreme example of quotes, but that's the kind of uh, uh, language that the council uh, would say, kind of wonderful quotation here from, uh, yes, the Fifth Island Council, some of the cardinals who had uh, tried to call a, a, a cisbanic council, but, Council of the Fifth Vatican Council said, we condemn, reject, and detest each and every one of those sons of perdition. <laughs> uh, there are no canons in Vatican II. The Roman Synod, which met in 1960, which was looked upon as kind of a dress rehearsal for the council, it was a local council, the Council of the Diocese of Rome, that in 1960, a dress rehearsal issued 775 canons. Vatican II issued none. Very significant. Uh, what is the literary form of Vatican II like? Well, it's, it's a form of invitation, really. It's a form of trying to raise your sentiments, to propose ideals, and to propose policy rather than set down, in every case, set down in every case, specific laws on certainly not making judgment on ecclesiastical criminals. So it's a new literary form, it's much more narrative, and I think if, for instance, Obama's speech uh, at the, uh, when he was, that his election as president in Chicago at the, uh, Grand Park, uh, is an example of this kind of rhetoric that tries to unite, lifts your, lifts, touches on your deepest aspirations, and tries to inspire you. What this then entailed for the council was a new vocabulary, a vocabulary new to councils. Not a vocabulary new to Christians by any means, but a vocabulary new to councils. And these words that occur occur so consistently and so repeatedly throughout the council that it has to be taken into account in interpreting the council. I divide into certain different categories, but they're all interrelated. One category would be horizontal words. So brothers and sisters, people of God, service, collegiality. Big word of the council that not only the 
bishops acting collectively for the good of the whole church, but also a collegial procedure, a collegial mode throughout the church. So participative, if you will. Reciprocity words, cooperation, partnership, collaboration, dialogue, Greek Vatican II word, and again, collegiality, friendship words, the human family, change words, development, progress, even evolution. Interiority words, not behavior modification, interiority words. The way, God, the way the document on the Church of the Modern World begins, the joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the people of this day. Those are interiority words. The great interiority word, of course, is conscience. And then the call to holiness, which is a great cross the board theme of the Council. And indeed, this new vocabulary. And this new literary form allows the call of the holiness to emerge as a theme of the council. So the council is really about spirituality. What it does sort of sets up a model for what the ideal Christian looks like, what the ideal church looks like, what the ideal churchman looks like, and how it behaves. I've got this little listing here of the sort of changes in values and priorities that the shift in vocabulary entails. Now, it has to be taken uh, not as an absolute, but as an indication of a, a moderation and a new sort of spin, if you will, from commands to invitations, from monologue to dialogue, from laws to ideals, from threats to persuasion, from coercion to conscience, from ruling to serving, from vertical and top-down to horizontal, from passive acceptance to active participation, from exclusion to inclusion, from static to changing, from hostility to friendship, from prescriptive to principle, from behavior modification to conversion of heart. So what's the input of this? The import is about how the church is to behave. The import is an ideal of the Christian life, an ideal of holiness, if you will. It's a modification of priorities that prevailed before modification, not displacement. Obviously, you have to have both of these. And it's a teaching. This pastoral mode, the shift of priorities, is a teaching. It's not a definition, it's a teaching in the council. So, as Cardinal Fabiani always said, you cannot separate pastoral from doctrine. You cannot separate pastoral from teaching. Indeed, I think this is a good example of it. So, what is this teaching? It's a teaching on the style of the church. It was an implicit but insistent call to holiness, and an insistent but implicit, implicit but insistent call to a change in style. A style less autocratic, more collaborative, a style willing to listen to different group viewpoints and take them into, into account. A style less unilateral in decision making. A style open and above board. A style committed to fair play. A style that is Jews, secret oaths, anonymous denunciations, and inquisitorial tactics. I think, I think the members of the council thought that this is the style of church that Pope John seems to be pointing toward in his allocution over the council on October 11th. 1962, when he said, the church should act, quotation, by making use of the medicine of mercy rather than severity, and by showing herself to be the mother mother of all, benign, patient, full of mercy and goodness. So no previous council ever undertook this kind of a revision, just one aspect of the revisions of that to all those others I've already talked about. But this is a big one, and I think it's one of those features that, again, sets Vatican II off so distinctively from the other councils. What this did, this change in style, redefined 
what a council is. Or modify what a council is. That legislative and judicial model, of course it's still there, but it's a secondary thing. The council is, this council is something else. It's a call to holiness, it's a, uh, raising up the Christian life to a set of ideas. So what I've done tonight is just talk about one aspect of Vatican II. It's a very rich uh, uh, subject and just had a limited amount of time. So uh, I just want to make, make, present that aspect of it and uh, Chris and I together uh, decide on this kind of thing, the, the, the uniqueness of Vatican II and how it fits with the other councils. Thank you. Thank you, Father O'Malley.